Welcome to this episode of One Book at a Time, the Manchester University Press podcast. Time to slow down, consider the issues, learn the histories and exercise your brain in the open air of considered judgment and frontline thinking and help us change the world one book at a time. Much as many of us Londoners might not acknowledge it, vibrant queer histories, communities and cultures exist beyond the M25 ring road that circles the capital. Pride events are now a feature of communities' queer calendars up and down the country, but there is still so much more. From anti-Section 28 activism in Brighton to Manchester's queer art scene, from the influence of the armed forces in Plymouth to lesbian feminism in Leeds, each city has its own distinct story to tell. Authors Matt Cook and Alison Oram focus on these four English cities in their book Queer Beyond London to highlight the vibrance and particularity of LGBTQ plus histories and experiences. My name is Justin Bengry, and I convened the MA Queer History at Goldsmiths, University of London. I was also the researcher on Queer Beyond London. In this episode of One Book at a Time, I began by asking Matt and Alison to discuss the big picture significance of Queer Beyond London. What did they want the book to do? What we were trying to do in this project is really think about the difference locality makes to ideas of identity or community. So the idea that being gay or lesbian in Plymouth, for example, might feel rather different than being gay or lesbian in Manchester. And we wanted to work out why that was the case. And so we were looking at different demographics, populations, the geography, the distance from these cities, from, from London and other places, um, to get a sense of the factors which might shape the, the way people understand their sense of selves and their communities. I mean, London often acts as the sort of default place for LGBTQ history um, in Britain. And, you know, there are some good reasons for that. It's the seat of government, it's where legislative change happens, it's therefore where a lot of political activism has happened in the past. But, you know, we found that there was plenty of different kinds of activity going on in, in the other cities. And we wanted to get away from the fact that London was a centre because, you know, the northern cities are really important, the southwest, and so on. So we wanted to look at the diversity of... LGBTQ experience. So you've already mentioned Plymouth and Manchester. Uh, what, what cities were included in the study and why did you choose those cities? We first of all chose Manchester and Brighton on the south coast because these have been the kind of iconic queer cities really since the 1960s, Brighton first of all, but then Manchester very much coming up um, in the 80s and 90s. And we wanted to get a sense of the difference in queer texture between those two places. But then we wanted some counterpoints as well. So we chose another sort of northern city, Leeds, which is not so very far from Manchester, but has quite a different culture and economy, um, and also um, countercultural history. It was a very important city in terms of second wave feminism, for example, and lesbian separatism and so on. And then we chose another south coast city as a counterpoint, partly to Brighton. So went all the way west to Plymouth. And to think about what this coastal city with its really strong naval history and tradition, what that meant to the way in which people thought about and conceived of their relationships and connections with others. So that was kind of loosely why we, we chose the four cities. There's also some personal connections. I was living in Brighton at the time when we were conceiving of this project. Alison was based in Leeds at um, Leeds Beckett University. I think we each got a strong sense of the quite distinctive queer LGBTQ cultures that wove through those different places. So I think we got a bit of a head start in that sense. And we also chose the cities because we knew that each of them had a really rich set of sources, particularly with the um, community oral history projects that had been carried out in many of those places. Brighton, first of all, in the late 1980s, 
and then several different projects in Manchester looking at particular sites in the city, for example, the LGBT centre. Leeds had a load of different projects which emphasised the sort of distinctiveness, at least in the 1980s, of the sort of separation between lesbian politics and gay men's experiences because the five or six oral history collections that around Leeds were quite distinct in terms of gender and so on. And in Plymouth, a wonderful friend of ours, a collaborator with the project, Alan Butler, had made a fantastic series of, of dozens of interviews with, with people in Plymouth, bringing out its very distinct and military significance. So one of the aims of the book was to simply to draw attention to all these regional and urban place-specific projects, because we think a lot of that work has been done and been important in each of those places, but has kind of slightly gone off the map for other people. You know, there have been hundreds of these projects. We wanted to draw attention to those and, and, and make use of this fantastic material. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more, actually, about the oral histories that were already done and the importance of oral history to this project, particularly with reference to the kinds of sources that are otherwise available for queer history anywhere, but particularly outside London, maybe. So, yeah, I mean, oral history was absolutely at the heart of this project. And it's because I think what that kind of testimony does is it gives you a sense of the texture of time and place and particular bars and community groups and so on. And it's also been very much part of LGBTQ history in this country. So one of the first ways in which lesbians and gays kind of made themselves present in the historical record was by recording each other in projects really from the late 70s, but especially from the later 80s in Brighton with this very important Brighton R Story project, which was launched really in part response to Clause 28, which of course was a piece of legislation which tried to shut down uh, lesbian and gay voices. And what the Brighton R Story project insisted upon was that there was a presence and there was a voice. And so they recorded this amazing collection of testimonies of men and women recalling the 50s and 60s primarily. And that really was a kind of key starting point for us, because what followed was a, a series of other oral history projects taking place in each of the four cities, which really grounded our wider research in, you know, using local government documents, the press, flyers, the gay press, all sorts of other materials. But we really kind of drilled down into the kind of emotional texture of those scenes and, uh, and networks in each of these places through this oral history material. So it was absolutely key. Each of the oral history projects in these different cities has a kind of different emphasis because it was recorded in different contexts at different political moments and so on. And so what we also did is we recorded our own oral histories where we saw particular gaps in the extant record in the, in the material that was already there. We also used other forms of local material like local newspaper reports, which give a flavour of how, well, certainly how those newspaper proprietors, but often how the city more generally through its local authority saw lesbians and gay men, particularly in the 60s, 70s and 80s, and how that was distinct in each city and how it changed over time. So Matt in particular for his chapters used a lot of newspaper material, but certainly the oral histories are so useful for seeing how people felt about the past and their feelings of nostalgia, for example, their stories about how they lived, how what they felt about the gay scene and how they felt the scene had changed and whether that was for better or for worse. I suppose the, the other point about oral history is it can only go back so far. So luckily the 1980s Brighton recordings went back to, well, they went back to the 1940s, in fact. So yes, the oral histories were particularly important for people's feelings about their, their pasts in their particular city, their sense of nostalgia for the past sometimes, that the gay scene was a lot better in the past, their involvement in politics, their fearfulness, particularly in the 1980s, and their sense of whether life had got better or, or worse. And, you know, there's a real difference between the cities in these respects. So oral histories are very useful in the absence of other material, but only go back so far. I mean, in our case, they only really went back to the 1960s in most of the cities. I mean, in places like Manchester, where there was more activism, as it were, very early on in the early 60s, there are more documents documents 
to be had. In fact, Manchester's um, queer resources are so voluminous that it's um, quite hard often to get a sense of them. But certainly in places where people were quite formally organised and were trying to put pressure for lesbian and gay rights as early as the 1960s in, in places like Manchester, then we have those records as well. I want to go back to something that you mentioned, Alison, about the place of London and the um, over, over-researched nature of London relative to other places. To what extent did you find, through the project, a relationship between these cities and London, or did it bypass London altogether? Well, it's, um, there wasn't that much mention of London, to be honest. I mean, the oral histories were gathered for the the different themes that the projects were looking at. So it did focus very much on their cities and how people came to live and work in those cities and their experiences. So we don't have that much sense of the relationship to London. I mean, sometimes an, an interviewee would talk about how they deliberately avoided London Jude, for example, moved from, I think it was North Wales to Hull to do their art degree in the late 70s. And then they moved to Leeds because of the strong lesbian feminist networks in that city. And they were very involved in in that, that kind of politics. But Jude said that they had deliberately rejected London. You know, they wanted to live in a in a big city, certainly bigger than her little village or town in, in Wales, but not the big city. I mean, you get stories of people moving between London and, and other cities, but it's only really for Brighton that London is a presence because a lot of people who live in Brighton work in London or talk about popping up to London to go out for an evening and so on. I mean, each of the cities had its own hinterland, which was experienced in different ways. That, and there were odd connections between the cities. There was a quite an interesting connection between Manchester and Plymouth, as it turned out. People would, from Plymouth, would go up to Manchester for its gay pride in the 1990s, to the extent they wanted to be out and go partying. And there was a sense of, I suppose, the community in Manchester being perhaps in some ways broadly similar to that in Plymouth, which was that sense of collectivity so there were links between the cities, but London, it doesn't loom large. I completely agree with Alison. I was, I was kind of thinking there's another aspect of this, though, which is also that, in a way, what distinguishes the four cities is partly the different relationship they have with the capital. So I think, for example, Plymouth is so distant from London, it's the furthest away. There's a rather glamorous sense of the capital when it is mentioned by people from Plymouth. Brighton, as Alison said, is really close and people would go up for the day or a night and vice versa. Londoners would come down to Brighton for some of the the kind of big clubs in the 90s. So there was a kind of more intimate kind of everyday relationship between Brighton um, and the capital. And then from Manchester, I think there's a certain rivalry, you know, the second city, you know, a a different scene, the idea of a cutting edge, but more cohesive scene than the capital. Um, And in Leeds, the the relationship is, is also interesting because part of the gentrification of Leeds, the centre of Leeds in the late 90s, 2000s, was about the development of the legal and financial services in Leeds. Um, and that area around the station developed partly because of a kind of commuting traffic between London um, and Leeds. And, and that is, was also the gay area. So there's a kind of interesting intersection there, I think, in some ways. And also, I think, I mean, having lived in Leeds for, sort of for quite a few years, I think Leeds has a sense of confidence about itself as a city which doesn't rely on a comparison with anywhere else really. So both of you have spoken about the themes of the project but we haven't really discussed what the themes of the project were. Could you could you uh, elaborate on those? Yeah so my half of the book um, looked at three different themes in different chapters. One was homes and housing and Although it's not as dramatic as political activism, which was covered in Matt's half of the book especially, I think everyday life and how people lived out their sense of their own queer selves and how they made home and made family is really, really important. And there were quite interesting distinctions between the four cities in that respect. My second theme was migration, migration. 
and because we were looking at the material from within those four cities we were looking at inward migration why did people end up in those cities and for what reasons did they move there or move back there or stay there even and that threw up a lot of interesting material as well and the distinctions between those places and the third theme was how people have a sense of the past so this goes back to the oral history and the community history projects what do people feel about that the past that they'd experienced well the older people in the sense of you know looking back to their clubbing days and how they felt things had changed the younger people looking at their sense of queer history and why it might be important to them and the difficult feelings that people often had fear um, nostalgia regret which were quite strong in some cities and not at all in some of the others. To the right hand side of the stage, please. There are literally thousands of us here today. Across the first half of the book, where I, I talk about the cities in turn, I think some particular themes emerged about what created the differences between these places. So, for example, a key thing that emerged was the difference of the local economy and occupational structures, how they mattered to the way in which queer people were living their lives. For example, in um, Manchester, there was a historic and very strong sense of workplace and unionised identity. And one of the things I, I argued in that chapter was that this actually really underpinned a strong sense of political collectivity between queer people in Manchester. First of all, on behalf of Manchester City Labour Party and the council, I'd like to welcome everybody from outside Manchester to Manchester and say what a wonderful and magnificent demonstration this is. And I contrasted that to what was happening in Brighton, where there wasn't the strong shared workplace identification, partly because Brighton was a city of sole traders. It was the service sector. People didn't have the connections that could be forged through mass industry or factory work and so on. As a result, I think a kind of validation of a different sort of individualism in Brighton that I think you can associate partly with the local economy. And then that's different again in Plymouth where the docks and the navy were these massive employers and really kind of structured everyday life for lots of people in the city. You know, not least because homosexuality was illegal in the armed forces until the year 2000. And so this culture of discretion was very, very important in Plymouth, even though there was a really vibrant queer scene kind of bubbling away just below the radar um, across the 60s, 70s. People at the moment in this country are very concerned about health, they're very concerned about civil rights. And we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that Clause 28, the attacks in the national media and the press on gays and lesbians, are disassociated. The importance the of kind of local economy and occupation came across for me, and also the importance of local government. So one of the big things in Manchester was that it had one of the first city councils outside London to really stand four square behind lesbian and gay people in the 80s. The reason Clause 28 has been introduced is to divert attention from their real project and to scapegoat and victimise and create second-class citizens. Manchester City Council and the Labour Party in Manchester are not prepared to be used to help create second-class citizens in this city or anywhere else. The result of that was both some practical stuff including, for example, support for the local lesbian and gay centre and for the development of the gay village along Canal Street. But it also meant that gay pride in Manchester got aligned with civic pride. There was a pride in what Manchester had done for queer people. That really stood out in relation to the other cities. You know, Brighton's council, for example, was relatively lacklustre in its support for queer people until the 2000s. And there was much more of a sense there of battling against local government. What you start to see, I think, when you look at the cities in detail, is the difference these things, these apparently extraneous things, economy, local government, geography and so on, they really make a difference to the way in which people experience themselves and their community in those particular cities. Yeah, as historians, it was really interesting to see how the kind of almost the queer character of each city developed over time. 
I mean, another factor, particularly for the northern cities, was the migration to them of hundreds of thousands of students over the years. So in Manchester, some of those students from the early 80s kick-started the queer arts culture in Manchester. In Leeds, they contributed to the, the, the quite sort of definitive and quite leftist politics and increasingly the very powerful feminist politics in that city. You know, that attracted more people who like to do those things, whether it was, I mean, I'm being a bit simplistic here, whether it was clubbing on the one hand or lesbian feminist politics on the other. I mean, obviously, both things went on in both cities. But Leeds, you can see this this kind of growth of politicisation fed by migration. And in Brighton, people have seen and continue to see Brighton as the kind of the gay capital beyond the rainbow. You know, it's the ideal place. And by the 80s, surveys were showing that 80% of gay residents in Brighton were not native to the area. They had migrated inwards to find this place where they could be freer amidst its gay shops, its bars, you know, its dense LGBT culture in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And by the well, by the 2000s, certainly, and during the 2000s, Brighton still held this place as a kind of wonderful destination. But in the 2000s, especially by trans people, as trans support groups built up in that city. And Brighton's a relatively small city in terms of population, so people really notice these changes. But the desirability of Brighton was reflected in people's accounts over decades and continues to today you know it's like this amazing possibility that one day we'll go and live in Brighton and you know be happy gay people and so on and I think that contributed very much to the individualism that Matt talks about as well that feeling amongst Brightonians that they live in the best possible place to be queer there's that sense of exceptionalism in Brighton that you know, you can do what you like, you can be who you like, you can dress as you like, you'll not get attacked for that in, in different ways or criticised for that. So you can kind of reinvent yourself in Brighton to perhaps a greater extent than the other cities. So you can see how these sort of senses of the cities are a kind of rolling development of their scenes. Um, so yeah, I think one of the really interesting things Alison's highlighting there too is the mythologies that surround particular cities. So, you know, actually daily life in Brighton could be tough. I mean, there were homophobes that used to come in in the 80s and and queer bash. There was muggings on the front in the 60s and 70s for sure. You know, life could be really hard, but the narrative, the mythology that was built around queer life in the city made it very appealing. And in fact, in some sense, that narrative helped people who lived there because it was a positive story. And one of the things that really occurred to me as Alison was speaking too was around demographics and the importance of identity. So one of the key things in Brighton was the idea of being lesbian, gay, trans and owning those identities. So when the AIDS crisis struck in the 80s and by the late 80s, there was debate about whether safer sex campaigning should be around not gay men, but men who had sex with men. This was roundly dismissed by the gay community in Brighton because the assumption and common idea was that men that had sex with men in Brighton were gay, would identify as gay. But that was very different in Leeds, where especially amongst South Asian men in the 90s, they weren't identifying as gay, but men were having sex with with other men. And so in Leeds, the safer sex campaigns were much more geared towards the non-identitarian campaigning than on the South Coast. So you start to see how people were understanding identity and sex lives in different ways in different parts of the country and partly because of the demographic makeup of these cities. Both of you have personal experiences of several of these cities. Were there any insights that came out of the Queer Beyond London research that surprised you about the cities? I suppose the extent of the lesbian feminist community and its distinctions in the 1980s in Leeds, the nuances of how women knew who lived in these different houses and squats and their political differences were very clear cut. I think there's a real sense for Manchester, which I know a little bit, although I've never lived there, the way that 
various other kinds of things come together in Manchester, how the very early gay activism in the 60s bears fruit by the 1980s in that the Manchester City Council, as Matt described, supported its lesbian and gay citizens and offered them housing at a pretty early date, the mid 80s, as did some other Labour councils and boroughs. But in Manchester, the difference is that it's sustained over time. So you've got this sense of that as a Manchester gay person, you're part of the wider city and you're looked after in all sorts of ways, potentially, including council housing and social housing, which a lot of interviewees talked about as more easily come by in, in Manchester, notwithstanding, obviously, the gentrification that's also gone on in the centre of Manchester. So that kind of interesting combination in Manchester of, of civic politics, you know, in a way, mainstream politics, pressuring the local council, plus gay and lesbian activism, plus the clubbing culture, and the size of the city means that, you know, there's a very diverse and extraordinary kaleidoscope going on in that city, which is held together by this sense of it in a very different way from Brighton being a good place to be lesbian or gay. I suppose my big surprise in the project was Plymouth, which I knew not at all before we started and in a way was the most distinct. It had the most distinct culture of men and women navigating the different pressures of work, family and queerness, and actually quite effectively living out their queer lives, if you like, in this uh, everyday negotiation. Um, so not being particularly out, of being proud of kind of passing, if you like, in this city, but still sustaining a pretty vibrant queer life and sense of queer connection with others in the city. And it, it was astonishing for me the extent to which the culture of discretion here, which had its roots in the illegality of homosexuality in the armed forces, but also had its roots in this being a family city with gay men and lesbians and trans people living close to families in regular touch with them, which meant they had to tread much more carefully than in, say, Brighton, which, as Hallison's pointed out, was a city of inward migration of queer people who were often moving away from families or homophobic communities elsewhere. And so there's a very different texture to Plymouth. And I was astonished, I think, really surprised at the extent to which that came through in our interview work and in our research in, in, in that city. Can I just add to Plymouth? Yeah, I mean, Matt mentions the importance of family. And in terms of migration to Plymouth, a lot of people were moving back to Plymouth if you didn't work in the docks or in the military, then you often had to leave the city to find work. But people felt this real pull back to Plymouth, despite the fact that you had to sort of pass under the radar. There was quite a lot of acceptance amongst their families, perhaps partly because they were military families and they'd travelled the world and seen, you know, how different people lived in the world. But there was a surprising degree of acceptance. So you get people moving back to Plymouth or it's mentioned more often than in other cities to, you know, look after their elderly parents, to still be in touch with their children if they had been heterosexually married and divorced. Yeah, so Plymouth was really interesting. It was also interesting because it was the least political city, not surprisingly. You know, it's hard to have alternative politics in the city, which is kind of built on traditionalism and the military. Anything to do with the peace movement in the 1980s was stomped on by the local press really didn't have any organising around Section 28, which was quite surprising given the size of the city. There was a small window in the local alternative bookshop called In Other Words, and in that window there was a poster about Section 28, but we really didn't get much from the interviews about people being interested in LGBTQ politics. However, they did have an awful lot of nostalgia. They looked back to the clubbing scene and the discos of the 1980s. So, you know, there was a vibrant gay scene in Plymouth, which people felt had been lost by the 1990s and 2000s, even though in the meantime, they had organised Plymouth Pride by the late 2000s, by about 2009, 2010. So, you know, there was a strong community, but the sense of change not being for the better was definitely more pronounced in Plymouth 
than in the other cities. I think one of the things in Plymouth was that there was, the sense of loss was of something that they saw as particular to their city. So the complaint in a way about the 2000s was that things had got generic and there was no longer these kind of queer corners of the city, you know, where there was this kind of slightly subterranean sense of, of queer identity. But the other thing I was thinking about when Alison was talking about politics was what Plymouth helped me to realise through its kind of lack of counterculture, if you like, and lack of alternative politics, was just how important the peace movement, the anti-racist movement, feminism, um, other forms of activism and politics were to queer lives in other cities. Um, And in particular, actually, Leeds and Manchester, where there was a very strong anti-racist movement, for example, um, in the face, in Leeds in particular, of a very active national front. Um, And that you start to see the crossover of sexuality, race, gender, politics in Leeds and in Brighton and in Manchester, but also actually in Brighton. You know, we had one interviewee, Melita, who talked about the way in which for her in the 80s, her animal rights activism, you know, in a way kind of funneled her into um, sexual politics and feminist politics and so on. So there's these kind of counterculture connections, often grounded in student life, in fact, which really came to the fore, partly because we really noticed their absence in Plymouth. So the kind of comparative element of this study really allows you to kind of see in sharper focus some of what distinguishes um, these cities and, and particular patterns of community in each of them. So Brighton, Leeds, Plymouth, and Manchester all have their own distinctive cultures and queer textures, but were there commonalities that you found by putting them in comparison as well? There's clear connections or resonances between the cities for all the differences between them. You know, for example, in the 60s, each of these cities had a kind of rough crossover pub or two or three pubs, which became a hub not just for lesbians and gays, But for other outsiders, and I'm using that term advisedly, so, you know, um, sex workers, sailors on their night out, various people who might be seen or see themselves as as somewhat marginal to urban cultures would often gather in these one or two city centre pubs. And each of the cities had one or two of those. Um, And they became really quite important places and that, that people were quite nostalgic about in retrospect. And of course, each of the cities also, if you were looking at a kind of general to take a bird's eye view, you would see, I think, in each place, the development of maybe more European style bars, roughly from the 90s through into the 2000s. And with the exception of Plymouth, you'd see Clause 28 as a a turning point. You'd see the importance, actually, of some of the equalities measures of the new Labour government and so on. So you can talk from a bird's eye view and see some connections and commonalities between these cities. But I think what the project really taught me is not to overemphasize those things because actually how those things felt in each place was very different. The kind of new bars in Brighton did feel different from the new bars in Manchester and partly because of the wider cultures and expectations. You know, in Manchester, this cutting edge music and dance culture meant that actually new bars there had that inflection which they lacked in Brighton. So, you know, we can make the generalisations, we can make those connections, but I still want to kind of nuance that with what was particular, you know, about those rough bars in the 60s or the new scene emerging in the 90s and 2000s. I mean, I think there were some interesting commonalities that we hadn't really thought about before we did the research. One is the way that lesbians in particular, but also queer people of colour, black men and black gay men and lesbians, had organised a lot of their social lives in private houses from the 1970s onwards, or in fact from the 1960s. I mean, there was a a lesbian network across the country which organised parties and and socials, and, and we've got evidence of that from certainly from Brighton, Leeds and Manchester. So I think your private house, your home, was an important focus for getting together with other LGBT people, and particularly if you were kind of othered in in other ways or felt vulnerable in other ways or were vulnerable in other ways. And the second point, really, is 
policing was very different in the four cities. It was pretty heavy in Manchester as, as you know, part of the kind of national history of lesbian and gay change. But in each city, there was a kind of movement against heavy-handed policing in the 1990s and a successful rapprochement with the police. So in Plymouth, there was a nasty murder in the mid-90s and people got together as activists to liaise with the police around that nasty murder. And in Brighton too, in the mid nineties, we can see that happening and in Manchester. And what happened in each of those cities was just within the space of a year or two, the police who had been keeping lists, particularly of gay men and their frequenting of bars and clubs, abandoned those lists, made it public they'd been keeping them and destroyed them. So you see this interesting sort of pushback by the community against heavy policing in the mid-90s, which of course obviously is a harbinger of broader liberalisation politically and socially in, in Britain towards queer people. But I thought that, that was an interesting sort of point about how community succeeded in in creating change in each of those cities very completely independently and in relation to specific local homophobic murders and queer bashings are there cities that you wish you could have included in the project or that you would imagine in some kind of queer beyond london version 2.0 or that you'd encourage others to take up the uh, uh, take up the reins in other projects oh com- completely i mean what the choice was hard partly because there's so much material on other so many other places um, in england we focused specifically on england we wanted that kind of national umbrella But actually, it would be really fascinating to expand the project to other UK cities. So to look at Edinburgh, Glasgow, Cardiff, Belfast, and really think about what those different national contexts, albeit under the umbrella of the UK, what difference those national contexts made. For example, in Belfast, the kind of sectarian divisions and how that played out in queer lives. And in fact, we have a companion edited collection of essays, which includes some reflections on those other national contexts, including Belfast, in fact, and, and, and Edinburgh. And it really does demonstrate how there's many, many more stories to be told about places in the UK and, of course, world world. And I suppose the other thing I'd say is that we focused on cities. I mean, we touch on the rural hinterlands of Plymouth, Leeds, Brighton to an extent. But, I mean, there's also really is room for an examination of rural queer life and the importance of the countryside to queer identity and identification in England and the UK more broadly in this period and before. Yeah, I mean, this is the tip of the iceberg, Justin. There's, there's lots, lots, lots more to do. Yes, and in fact, um, a more recent project, which was too recent for us to include, called West Yorkshire Queer Stories, does look at that. It looks across the whole of West Yorkshire, including the villages as well as the cities. And yeah, of course, if we just think of cities, there are <laughs> loads of towns and cities that absolutely bear drilling into their their specific queer characters. I mean, I did a talk in Nottingham quite recently, and they're very keen to assert their identity as as always a very active and important LGBT city. I mean, Birmingham, obviously the same. And we know that in Bristol, there's been a a load of work done on queer history over the past few years. So yeah, the the field is ripe for other people to do this comparative work. I mean, we were in quite a privileged position of having the time and the resources to make these comparisons. Yeah, let's hope that other students and academics and community LGBT projects do use these amazing resources and think about how their town or city or neighbourhood even compares to, to others. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Manchester University Press podcast, One Book at a Time. The archive footage of Manchester's Section 28 protests was courtesy of Nick Lansley. If you like what you've heard, please check out the MUP website, www.manchesteruniversitypress.co.uk, where you can find and order a copy of this book and many others like it.
Don't forget to follow us on all major social media platforms and subscribe to our newsletter for 30% off all our books.